Hey everyone, welcome back to Bible Basics and Beyond. I'm your host, Jaden Gomez, and I'm so happy that you're joining me for another brand new episode. And I'm so excited for today's topic because it's a big one and I get a lot of questions about it. But before we start, let me give you the quote of the week. And Voltaire once said, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Think about that this week. Now, let's get into this week's episode. Have you ever wondered, what's God's deal with homosexuality? Why does it seem to be such a biggie? And have you ever wondered if all Christians are homophobic? Well, that's exactly what we're looking at today, and I can't wait to get into this big and controversial topic. I am so excited to unpack this controversial and hot topic, homosexuality and Christianity. I think society has led people to believe things that are untrue or without evidentiary basis about Christianity and homosexuality. You know, I also believe there needs to be a change in the hearts of some Christians when it comes to homosexuality. Not in terms of the theology of it, but how we treat anyone struggling with their sexual orientation. And there is so much more judgment than there is compassion and understanding right now. And that's what we need, compassion and understanding. So today, to explore this hot potato, as they say, I want to go through three main points. One, minds need to be changed. Two, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And three, did Jesus speak about homosexuality? So without further ado, let's get into point number one, Minds need to be changed. So what do I mean by minds need to be changed? Let's start with the stereotype that all Christians are homophobic, shall we? Christians are not homophobic. I mean, where did that even come from? Christianity is not a religion of fear, but a religion of love. You know, it was because of love that God sent his son Jesus to die for us so that humans could come back into a a relationship with the Father. And Adam and Eve walked away. You know, they decided they knew better than God. And they lost their way. They lost the plot. But God continued to show his love, even though they had rejected him and his ways. You know, homophobia is a fear of homosexuality. And yes, some Christians may display a hatred or fear of homosexuality, But I see the same fear and hatred on the other side of the divide, where homosexuals hate Christians and label all Christians as homophobic. In my view, labels tend to quell meaningful conversations and a respectful exchange of ideas. You know, I've had to deal with being labeled homophobic almost my whole high school life simply because I'm a Christian. You know, at this point, I don't even care what label is put on me, because I know it is not true. But at the end of the day, I still want to clear up any misconceptions and change minds through the word of God. And yes, I agree that there are Christians who are homophobic, but that fear probably stems from a wrong understanding of the Bible. So let's get to this mind change. We are not called to judge each other for our choices. We are not called to condemn one another. You know, let's start with this. So in Romans 14, um, this this mind change is perfectly summarized. And in Romans 14, Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome at the time. So I'm reading from Romans 14, from verse 8 to verse 13 in the New King James Version. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? 
Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Wow. So we are not called to judge each other for our choices. We are not called to condemn one another. And here's the next part. But we are called to love one another just as Christ has loved us. You know, let's look at a couple of verses. John 15 verse 12. My commandment is this. Love each other as I have loved you. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14. Do everything in love. 1 Peter 4 verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Ephesians 5 verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 1 John 4 verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And I can keep going on and on. There's so many verses that talk about love, God's love, and how we should love others, that we should love our neighbor as our friend. I will go into what the Bible teaches about homosexual behavior in the next point, but primarily, the foundation of Christianity is love. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall be saved and i think the most important thing christians need to learn is not to hate or fear but to love the lgbtqi community there are also you know there are also christians out there who are struggling with their own sexuality their beliefs and how to live and when christians respond in an unloving and condemning judgmental attitude it is a very poor reflection of Jesus. We need to build each other up instead of putting each other down. You know, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because of Jesus' love and sacrifice, we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I am not to judge them, but I am called to love my neighbor as my friend, love my enemy, love no matter what. That is what I would say. All right, let's get to point number two, which is, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? You know, I'm not an expert on the Bible, and I'm not going to pretend that I am one either. I too am exploring these topics each and every episode, so please don't think these are fact. After you listen I encourage that you go and do your own research and listen to experts like Dr. Sean McDowell or Dr. Frank Churik or even someone like Colby Martin who's on the other side of this argument. Okay, so to begin this point, let's start with the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 verses 26 to 28 tell us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The very first chapter of the Bible reveals that God made man and woman and ordained marriage. He blessed them and told them to procreate and be fruitful and multiply. In the book of, Levit in the book of Leviticus, when Moses set out civil laws for the Israelites, sexual relationships between men were prohibited 
specifically in Leviticus 18 verse 22 and Leviticus 20 verse 13. Now, some argue that the prohibitions only relate to cultic prostitution associated with pagan temples. However, the terminology employed is general and does not seem to be limited only to temple worship. Now, others argue that the laws of Moses are archaic and don't apply today. The laws describe other types of prohibited sexual behavior, including incest, adultery, and bestiality. The laws also deal with murder and other behavior that may destroy the fabric of civil society. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Christians living in the heart of the Roman Empire, um, he taught that there appears to be a connection between giving up on the centrality of God and society's downward spiral. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. For this reason, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men's likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now this is found in Romans 1 verses 21 to 27. Now some believe that this refers to what is natural to the individuals themselves heterosexual people participating in gay activities and thus going against their natural orientation. But the context does not support this viewpoint. There is also another view that homosexual desires are not sin. Only homosexual behavior is. You know, we all have desires and attractions we ought not to act on. There is a difference between attraction and action. And that is what Paul is addressing. And that's why he's be addressing the behavior. Whichever view is taken, there's quite a lot to think on. You know, now, after we've looked at what the Bible says, I now would like to move on to what Jesus himself said and did. All right, let's get to point number three, which is, what did Jesus say about homosexuality? Well, Jesus did not specifically address homosexuality. Now, this might seem surprising because during that time, the um, homosexual behavior was common in Rome, in, in the Roman Empire, in fact. But Jesus did address sexual immorality and he called it sin, pointing out that the source of all sin is the heart. In fact, he addressed the central issue, the desire, not just the behavior. You know, Matthew 5 verses 27 to 28 tell us, You have heard it said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a, at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 15 verses 10 to 20 tell us, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are what defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now Jesus said fornications, sexual immorality, defiled us. It is sin. But the source of sin is the heart. You know, I've heard a thought, a thought that Jesus was pointing out the futility of trying to change outward behavior without a changed heart. 
Now, we can learn a lot from how Jesus responded to all sin, including sexual immorality, best illustrated by his compassionate dealing of the woman dragged to him for judgment as she had been caught in adultery in the Gospel of John chapter 8. Now, I've often wondered, where was the other person she was caught in adultery with? Jesus bent down and started writing with his finger on the ground. Now, some have coined that he was writing the Ten Commandments. But then Jesus said in John 8 verses 7 to 11, he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not say that love is love, it's all right. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, I believe that Christians can learn so much from how Jesus, in loving compassion, addressed the sin in all of us, including her accusers. He did not shame the accusers or the woman. He just used the law as a mirror to address their conscience, their consciences. My number one takeaway for you is, while we do not condone sin, it would do us all good to be slow to cast stones, as we have one Savior, the man Jesus Christ, who alone can save us from sin, and who does not condemn us, but instead gives us the gift of his righteousness. Romans 3 verses 23 to 24 For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Thank you for tuning in this week. I hope you learned something today. Join me next week as we continue to explore the Bible and Christianity and all that lies behind it. Have an amazing week and remember, God loves you.